Welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today we have with us a global leader and luminary, David Casey, Vice President of Workforce Strategies and Chief Diversity Officer for CVS Health. David, welcome. Thank you, Thank George. You, George. Thank you for having me. David, it's you know always an incredible pleasure to have and to have the opportunity, really, to have a conversation with someone like yourself who is changing the world. Not many people can say they're impacting so many lives on a daily basis. And I personally and professionally believe that leadership is key to changing the world. And so today we have you with us and I'd like to ask you, could you tell our global audience a little bit about yourself as well as your role and responsibilities at CVS Health as the Vice President for Workforce Strategies and Chief Diversity Officer at CBS Health. And so George, you know, I'll start off with saying that the work that I get to do is quite honestly a blessing. You know, I get to do work that impacts people as professionals. And so many times I get, I've been told by people over the course of my career, you've also helped me become a better person. And uh, there, I can't think of any more gratifying work than that. So in my role at CVS Health, I have accountability for three teams or three functions. Uh, one is our EEO and affirmative action team, equal employment opportunity and affirmative action. And since we are a federal contractor, we are held to a standard of having a workforce that's reflective of the marketplace. So, you know, we do look at our gender representation. We look at race and ethnicity. We look at disability status and veteran status underneath the auspices of our affirmative action and EEO work. The um, Second accountability I have is the strategic diversity management team. And underneath that function and team, we have four primary objectives. One ties back to our EEO and affirmative action work where we are, our goal, or our aspiration is to be reflective of the people and customers that we serve. Our second pillar in that uh, framework is to have a culture of inclusion and belonging and have CVS not just be a place where people come to work, but a place where they truly feel like they belong and are making a difference. The third pillar in that framework is what we call talent systems. And that's ensuring that everyone has equitable access to growth and development in the organization once they join the company. And then the fourth pillar, George, is what we call uh, diverse marketplaces. And that's really meeting the needs of all of our external constituents. And we have a lot, their customers, their clients, suppliers, the communities in which we do business, legislators, regulators. So a whole lot of people outside the four walls of the, of the organization. And the uh, third team that I have accountability for you know, is what we refer to as workforce initiatives. And I like to refer to them as a talent R&D function for the company. And our primary goal and focus is to uh, help people get access to meaningful career paths that may not have a traditional path um, to a career opportunity in an organization. So it's people with disabilities, uh, transitioning military veterans, older workers, disconnected or opportunity youth, second chance citizens, the immigrant community. So uh, again, you know, a lot of folks who may not have what many of us may consider a traditional path into a career pathway. You know, David, that, you know, having responsibility for one team sounds like a lot of work, let alone multiple teams and all critical and vital teams that are really literally changing the communities that you're serving. And so, in terms of, of that and good health and well-being, we at IdeaGen focus our efforts on creating awareness for those 17 global goals of the United Nations. Those 17 goals that were unanimously agreed to by the UN, by all 193 member states, including the United States of America. Yeah. And so could you help explain to our global audience how you and your team have been using innovation in such positive ways to help achieve goal number three, which is good health and well-being of the UN Global Goals. Yeah, so George, my team again gets to play in some very creative spaces that um, maybe not a lot of functions that do what I do might get the opportunity to do. Let me give you a quick example. One is uh, we serve as a founding sponsor and, uh, and partner for what, um, what's called Smart Student Health. And smart student health centers are really designed to flip on its head the way the student health is delivered to, um, uh, to students in the school environment. And uh, what we've done is it's an active care and active access model 
when you think about a lot of traditional student uh, health models or nurses clinics, as we used to call them back in the day when I was in school, um, many of them were meant to be reactive. There are places where kids might come when they're sick. And, and let's just be real, they were places where some kids may go just to get out of class or maybe some of the, the not good students would go. We've turned that model on its head to say, why should we only see reactively at best 10, 15, maybe even 20% of the student population? Why shouldn't we be seeing 100%? of the student population and making sure we're engaging them in health and wellness and preventative care in addition to reactive care. So that's what the smart student model is really designed to do. Uh, we're really uh, focused up front on getting consents from parents to see the children. And uh, right now we're in seven different sites across the country. Uh, we're in uh, Chicago. We, we set up an urban model in Chicago. Uh, that was one of our first sites. And that worked so well, we said, okay, Let's try this in a rural setting. So we went to rural Alabama uh, to see if the model that worked in this urban setting would also work in a rural setting. And we started to see results in Alabama months, be, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a quicker time frame than even what we saw in Chicago. So we're averaging about a 98% uh, consent rate, actually closer to 100% consent rate. And then we're seeing about 98% of the students in these schools. So it's no longer the place where the pregnant girls go or the bad students go or someone who has a sickness that they may be ashamed of. or the, It's a place where everybody goes uh, to make sure that they are proactively addressing their health care. And um, graduation rates have skyrocketed. Disciplinary actions have plummeted in these schools. So it only stands to reason when you, when you take a step back and you think about it intuitively, you say, okay, these students were not learning. They maybe weren't behaving the best because they weren't well. They either had a physical illness or a mental illness that wasn't being addressed. And in many cases, it wasn't being addressed because there was a stigma tied to it. And we have removed that. So, uh, you know, my team gets an opportunity to engage in initiatives like that. And you may say, okay, well, what does it have to do with workforce initiatives? Well, if students can't, if they're not healthy, they can't learn. If they can't learn, they can't graduate and they can't earn and become productive members of society. So that's the uh, that's one example of how we try to think creatively out of the box and, and look holistically at systemic solutions. Looking holistically at systemic solutions and, and my gosh, I mean, the work that you're describing is absolutely profound in terms of the impact and a few short months ago, David, in January, we were looking at the roadway, the roadmap to 2030. And six short months later, the world has experienced an unprecedented hidden enemy that literally took the entire planet and brought it to a halt. And at CVS Health, you all have demonstrated leadership. You've demonstrated what I term to be dynamic resiliency. And you've demonstrated empathy. Three, three areas that I think are critical to survive and be resilient. How have you at CBS Health been able to adapt? If you could describe for us the adaptation, the, just the ability to not only survive, but thrive by helping others during this global pandemic. How has that all come about at CBS Health? You know, George, one of the things that I'm really, I'm proud of a lot of things that CVS Health has done to pivot and, and really uh, understand how we can leverage the assets we bring to bear uh, to the marketplace and to our communities. I'm very proud of the way we were able to pivot um, and, and what none of us saw coming, you know, uh, before the February and March timeframe, at least uh, for the, the general population. And, um, you know, one of the roles that we stepped up into, stepped into to play a big role in is testing. You know, making sure that people can get tested to understand whether or not they have this uh, COVID-19 virus. And you think about it, we have 10,000 stores across the country and uh, about 75 percent of those stores are within a couple of miles of uh, U.S. citizens. So, you know, we're, we're able to reach a lot of folks in their community. So we took a step back to say, you know, as opposed to just being a pharmacy, as opposed to just being a front store, what else can we do to make sure people can get access to testing? So we've done a couple of things in that area. One is where by the end of this year, 
we will have rolled out 4,000 uh, plus store-based testing sites. So these are, you know, uh, folks can come into a CVS. They can do the self-swab testing. They can, uh, you know, get that off to a lab and get their results back. So, so we're making access easier for people to get uh, a hold of that testing. But even in addition to that, one thing that we've done that, that my team and I have been able to play a role in directly, even more so than the store-based testing, is community-based testing. You know, um, when, I, when I thought about the original model for COVID testing, a lot of it was focused on drive-through, um, you know, mass transit testing or rapid, rapid testing, you know, people driving through big tents in cars, you know, um, I think there was a lot of concern around physical distancing and safety and, and also just being able to get large volumes of people through testing. So it struck me one day as I was looking at a post on social media, it was a post of uh, a train in New York. And this particular train was full of black and brown people. And the, 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 the uh, you know, genesis of the, of the post was that, you know, these folks have to take mass transit. They can't physical distance. These are essential workers. So the light bulb came on for me because at that point we knew that blacks and African-Americans were dying at two and a half times the rate of white Americans from COVID-19. And we were starting to see some data around the impact for the Hispanic and Latino community as well. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the connections were made in my mind. Okay, you have this population that's dying at a disparate rate, but many, I'm sitting here watching these people on a train that may not have access to a personal vehicle. So what can we do about that? So we, we were uh, partnering with HHS. We reached out and, and uh, under a contract with HHS, we also stood up what we call community-based testing sites. And these are testing sites where people can walk in. Uh, they still schedule an appointment. Uh, you know, we, they schedule appointments by phone because we wanted to be smart about if people didn't have access to the Internet, uh, which is the way that most people schedule appointments to get testing. How else can they, you know, get in and schedule an appointment? So they schedule by phone. Uh, it's at no cost uh, to people coming in to get tested, but they can walk in. So for individuals who may not have access to a private vehicle, which in some cities like Detroit may be close to 40% of the population, right? Uh, we were able to stand at these community-based testing sites. And myself, along with uh, Dr. Garth Graham, who's our Vice President of Community Health and Impact, uh, we're accountable for leading a cross-functional team to figure out how to make this work. And you can imagine the logistics of setting up a community-based site in partnership with churches. Uh, we're, we're partnering with community colleges. We're partnering with community and free clinics uh, to actually house these testing sites. When you think about the logistics of having to set these sites up, um, you know, at these locations that are outside of this, uh, the scope of control of a CVS store or a company environment, it takes quite a bit to do that. And uh, I'm proud to say that as of today, we have tested more than 80,000 people in these community-based testing sites. And we're still seeing on average positivity rates in the, in the upper teens, 16, 19%. In some communities, we're seeing positivity rates over 20% still. And I think the national average is somewhere around eight or nine. So we are in the communities that need access to this care most. And uh, we, done, we did it in a way that, um, you know, we put the idea on the table because nobody else was, had really been thinking about it at that point. So that makes me extre extremely proud as well. And where, where do we begin to talk about the impact that you're making, you know, it, and, and seeing the insights and the unique vantage point that you have from CBS Health, I think, is incredibly, while, while it's a scary time for many, it's also a, an inspiring moment to see a company like CBS Health leading the way. Because, again, I believe it takes leadership, David, and your leadership is evident in everything you just described, which is incredibly admirable. And so during these times of this pandemic globally, there have been, uh, there's been a, a bright light shown on disparities, including racial disparities, and health especially as well. And so what do you see, again, from your very unique vantage point, what do you see, David, as the best approach to dealing with these racial disparities in health? You know, George, I, I think one of the, one of the things we have to do is to be willing to call them out for what they are. I'll never forget 
when the data started to to really hit the hit the public, and we started seeing that you know these death rates two and a half times in the Black and African American community, I posted a uh, something on LinkedIn. And it wasn't an editorial. It wasn't an opinion piece. It was a data piece. It may have even been from Johns Hopkins that was showing the data on the disparate rate of deaths uh, in the Black and African American community. And I had this, a uh, couple of people responded and they said, oh my gosh, we're in the middle of a global pandemic or at the start of a global pandemic. Now is not the time to have conversations about race or make this about race. And George, I thought that was odd. You know, we knew at the beginning or the outset, uh, very early on in this pandemic, that older Americans and older older people, period, not just here in the U.S., but older people, period, were more susceptible to the ravages of COVID-19. You know, nobody disputed that. You know, everyone said, OK, well, we need to be thoughtful about that. We need to, to make sure we're protecting, you know, older people. We need to make sure that uh, we're addressing their needs. So that was not disputed. But as soon as I brought out the data, that spoke to racial disparities, that seemed to be a line in the sand and a line that we don't cross for several people. And I think, George, it's because we've never been able to have productive, thorough, authentic, and real conversations about race in this country. So I think one of the first steps to addressing racism is actually being willing to acknowledge it and recognize it when it shows up. It does not mean that everyone sitting around the table uh, in these situations is racist, but it may mean that the system is racist, that the system is disparately impacting people. Why should we not be willing and able to address that? So I think the first step is being is getting past this this reticence or or this 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 hesitancy around talking about race. We have to jump in. We have to lean into it and have these conversations. And you know we've seen time and time again. Uh, you know, in, a, in an interview the other day, uh, one of these global leaders cited her parents in their experience in Auschwitz and having escaped the Holocaust. And I think it's, a, it's an element of, it's not what we've, what's happened, I think, in many parts of the world is there's been a division amongst people. And what we do at IdeaGen is we bring people together to have these authentic conversations. Because to your point, David, and obviously we agree, the ability to communicate, to empathize yeah. is extremely important. It's not a political issue. Yeah. It's a people issue. People have the ability to communicate. We need to be able to allow for, for forums, for the opportunity. Yeah. For folks to get together. We've heard time and time again why folks feel like certain um, political systems are broken. It's because the people don't get to know each other anymore and on and on. I think there's truth to that. But being able to have an authentic conversation and to never forget the past. Yeah. I mean, it's so important to remember the past so that we don't relive it yeah. or recreate it or allow it to happen again in the future, whatever that is. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to have these types of important, very authentic conversations. If we're always speaking in sound bites, it's very difficult to make anything happen because I'll say what I think and here's how we fix it. And then we go on and on. And so we pivot now to your role. We've been through and are still going through this global situation. And I'd like to ask you, David, what has been the most rewarding moment for you at CVS Health as we all battle through this? And what made it so rewarding? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, the conversations I get to have with folks on the ground in communities. I had a conversation with the church pastor in L.A. at one of the sites where we were doing community based COVID testing, and he was so thankful. He was thankful that, you know, they, we could offer this service to his congregants. And many of them did not have, they, they were very mobility challenged. They didn't have access to, um, uh, to the, the healthcare services that, that they really needed. So, you know, he was just so, he was so taken aback by the fact that we would proactively think to reach out to him, this church, 
in a community. This big Fortune 5 company is reaching out to him, this single church in a community, to ask if we can partner to help serve his congregants and uh, get them access to COVID testing, many of them who are older as well, who needed to get access to it. You know, hearing the, the, um, the gratitude of someone who doesn't expect that from corporate America, that, that, that is really something that really jumps out and stands out to me because what I hope is that I'm a part of changing the face of what people think corporate America is and the role that corporate America should play in these kinds of situations. Many times I think people hear, oh, CVS, uh, 300,000 employees, Fortune 5, you're just a big machine. And what CVS Health is, is an aggregation of individuals. We are all people. You know, we, we go to church. We have family members who go to churches. We have family members in communities. So um, that was really something that really uh, jumped out at me was just the, the amount of gratitude, which kind of took me aback for a second because I was like, why are you expressing this, this amount of gratitude? Why are you so surprised or shocked that a company would reach out to you to, to, to establish this partnership? And, and, and again, to me, that just signaled an opportunity to really change the nature of how corporate America engages all of those different entities in our communities to bring these um, to bring these types of services and solutions to the folks who need them the most. Services and solutions, isn't that profound? And to hear to hear your reaction to the gratitude expressed to you, you know, I think oftentimes we forget that it's people that run these organizations. They're not amorphous, it's individuals at every level. Name the company, name the NGO, and name the public sector. Yeah. And it's not an amorphous individual. And therefore lies, I think, the inspiration, the inspiration and the ability. And by the way, what we believe to be the most important element, which is that leadership. That's why the leadership is so important because you look at leaders like Alex Korsky at Johnson & Johnson, just one example. You know, here's one individual, but he's setting the tone for the rest of the company who are also individuals. It's not, it's not you know, a, 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 a robot. This is real people doing real work. And in your case at CVS Health, changing the world, literally, com one community at a time. And that is profound. And, and it's also intentional. So that's the part that's really inspiring about this conversation, David, is that you're intentionally doing this. It's not happening by accident. And so I'd like to personally and professionally applaud you for that because it's authentic, it's real, and most importantly, it's impactful. And so at CVS Health, you've got so many programs. What sort of programs or opportunities are you working on at CVS Health to help us ultimately achieve goal number 10, reduced inequalities. Yeah, so um, we're working on a lot. We were working on a lot prior to COVID-19 and prior to the George Floyd killing, which has sparked, um, you know, global uh, protest and, 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 you know, global, uh, you know, energy around dealing with uh, inequities and, and police brutality and things of the like. So we were already doing a lot even before any of that hit. But I'll tell you one thing that, uh, uh, several things that we've undertaken since the murder of George Floyd that I'm extremely proud of and, and none of us wanted to get there through the death of George Floyd, but I'm, I'm proud to see um, you know companies like CVS Health and uh, you know step in and, and play the role that we can play. You know, one of the things that I've been very clear about is that CVS Health as a company alone cannot undo the ravages, cannot undo the damage of 401 years of inequity in this country that Blacks and African Americans have faced. But we do have a role to play in helping to address equity going forward. And we will play that role. Um, so back in June, we announced a commitment uh, that totals, in, in as far as the amount of investment, it's about $600 million dollars worth of uh, financial investments over the course of five years to address the needs of our Black and African American colleagues or employees. We refer to our employees as colleagues, uh, the community. So how can we make sure that we get deeper into communities to make sure that people get access to affordable quality care, 
Um, you know, what, what can we do to make our community safer uh, for all of our employees and the people that we serve? So community is number two. And then number three is how can we leverage our voice and how can we leverage our, our strength and reach and depth um, uh, to, to, to uh, you know, impact public policy? So public policy and voice is that third leg. And um, so what we want to do is to make sure that, you know, I mentioned, I used the term systemic earlier. And, and we took 30 days before we announced what these investments were going to be. And our CEO is really talking about leadership. Our CEO, Larry Merlo, is the one who charged us with doing that. You may remember, George, after the, the murder of George Floyd, a number of companies had come right out of the gates. We're going to give a million dollars to this. We're going to give $2 million to that or 500000 or whatever. And um, we didn't do that right away. And we actually faced a little bit of criticism over that. You know, people were starting to say, okay, well, I saw X company come out right after, you know, this happened. And I haven't heard anything from CVS Health yet. What we were doing, what our CEO charged us to do, he said, take 30 days. And I, we need to assess what is it that we do well? What do we need to do more of? And what are we not doing at all that we should start doing? So that's how we got to the 600 million in investments. It wasn't just about the number. It wasn't about the dollar amount. It was really understanding how can we build upon the things that we already do well as a company to do even more? And what are the, where are the gaps? Where are the holes and things that we're not engaged in at all that we should be? So um, you know, that's how we kind of entered into the playing field. Uh, to make sure that we can play the role that we should be playing and have the impact that we should have. Not often, not often am I at a loss for words. It happens on occasion, and at this moment, I am. I, I think, David, that that you've just described uh, leadership. That 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 is leadership defined is a CEO working with his colleagues, yeah. and that's also profound. I must say, if you want equality within an organization. You refer to your coworkers as a colleague. That sets the tone, and that also is demonstrative of what we're talking about here. Is it's people and leadership, and so when you're combining these things, you have the profound impact and the profound effects that you're describing. You took 30 days. You didn't want to just do something for a headline yeah. to say that you did it to check the box like happens so many, so often in well, not like companies, but NGOs. And of course, in the public sector, you wanted and, and Larry wanted, your CEO wanted to make a tangible difference. Yeah. And the way you just described it is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And so you have led, you're leading, and here you are, CVS Health earns a spot on the Diversity Inc. top 50 companies for diversity. How, this is your role, how did you make that happen? <laughs> well, let me be clear. I did not make it happen. Uh, we, we, we have a whole host of colleagues who make it happen. I'm just fortunate enough that I have the accountability to lead the function, but we have a lot of people making it happen. And I do, I, I seriously mean that. Um, you know, so a, a couple of things that really stood out for us, I think that helped us really earn our ranking in that Diversity Inc. Uh, top 50 companies for diversity. One is supplier diversity for sure. That has been a strong suit for us for many, many years. Uh, it has grown exponentially in the 10 and a half years I've been at the company. And um, so we spend uh, roughly $2.2 .2 billion with uh, uh, diverse suppliers. And that's there's a whole litany of, um, of um, uh, labels and categories that make up that supplier diversity bucket. It's minority-owned companies, women-owned companies, uh, disabled veteran-owned companies, hub zone companies. So it's it's a whole list of uh, companies that make up that category. But um, we have grown that to two point two billion dollars, and uh, we are part of the what's called the billion-dollar roundtable as well. And there's only about roughly there's roughly twenty six or twenty seven companies in the entire country that have committed more than a billion dollars to supplier diversity spend. So we're one of them. Uh, so that certainly is one of our areas of strength that I think really propelled us into the Diversity Inc. top companies for diversity. And it certainly helped us to increase our ranking uh, uh, on that list as well year over year. And for us, George, what, what, what makes me proud about our supplier, supplier diversity work is not just a matter of 
calculating how much money we spend with vendors. That's easy enough. What that team does is they go through and they actually do a impact assessment in all of the communities where we do contract with suppliers. And uh, they look at um, how many jobs are are the uh, contracts that we have in those communities. How many jobs are being supported? Uh, what kind of uh, payroll and salary is being supported? How is it impacting the tax base? Um, so that $2.2 billion equates to a little bit more than 38,000 jobs that are being supported because of the money we spend with diverse suppliers to help us do our work as CVS Health. Um, and I think another area that really helped propel us, going back to your earlier statement about colleagues, is how we engage our colleagues to help us do this work. We have um, over 22,000 colleagues that participate in what we call colleague resource groups. Some companies call them affinity groups. They may call them networking groups. We have 15 of these groups stood up around the company. When I first got to the company 10 and a half years ago, we had 400 uh, colleagues participating. Now we have 23,000. So these are colleagues who have all committed, in addition to their day jobs, to help us execute on our diversity management strategy. So those are two areas that I know. Oh, and the last area is our corporate social responsibility and uh, how we've engaged uh, in really, you know, extending beyond the four walls of our company to impact and give back to our communities. And volunteerism is certainly a big piece of that as well. So I, I think those are three big factors or primary components that have really positioned us on that, uh, what I call better practice list. I think there are very few best practices, but I will uh, um, I will um, uh, give in to being able to call them better better practices. Where do we begin? Uh, you know, this is uh, what you're describing is so so just impactful and so profound on so many levels about the impact and the work that you're doing with your colleagues. I, I can't get that out of my head now. With your colleagues, your coworkers at CVS Health. And shifting a bit, David, I know that you are a proponent, a proponent, an advocate for working across sectors. Yeah. You're yeah. CVS Health, you're in the communities across the nation, you're changing the world. You now have Aetna with CVS Health. It's a giant, really global company now. As we look at cross-sector collaboration and innovation, why are these two combined, collaboration and innovation, so vital to helping to solve so many of the world's most vexing issues? By the way, you alluded to a lot of it in our discussion so far today. Yeah. But I want to go a step further. How do you also infuse that collaboration and innovation into your daily mission to successfully achieve your goals? There is no other way to do it not successfully, not sustainably, there is no other way to do it. And I very rarely speak in absolutes, but I will tell you there is absolutely no way without collaboration are you gonna get to breakthrough and sustainable in innovation. It's just, I would say it's impossible. Um, I'll give you a quick uh, example of that, uh, George. In our workforce initiatives work, that work is all about helping people who are taking, again, I'll use the term non-traditional career paths into career pathways inside of CVS Health. And um, it's more than just us. And, and, and George, you, we've known you for a long time and you know you know us very well. So, so you, you know how these programs work and, and you know that we don't just teach people how to fill out a resume or how to do an interview. We look at that individual holistically. Are they having barriers to childcare? Do they have barriers to transportation? You know, is there a uh, food insecurity issue we need to deal with? Is there a housing insecurity issue we need to deal with to make sure they are long-term successful in the workplace? We even have, when I got to the company, a very, very unique and innovative program called Prescriptions for Home Ownership that the Workforce Initiatives team managed and sponsored for the company. So here's a team situated in HR that is designed to help people get access to favorable rates on a mortgage for buying their first home and partner with the faith community to do financial counseling for individuals buying their first home. And then the company gave individuals some money to put towards a down payment or closing costs or whatever they needed to buy that first home. So here's a team focused on the workforce that structured a program like that, that um, 
engage the financial community or the financial sector, that engage the faith-based sector to make sure that we were looking at these individuals who are going to join our organization holistically. So we never could have done that on our own. If all we were focused on was helping these individuals fill out an application and interview, that wasn't helping them get, get past the home and security issues or transportation issues or child care or whatever their, their other needs were. So what we do in that space if we have we manage now, I think roughly over 700 partnerships around the country. These are local, state, and federal partnerships with faith-based institutions, community colleges, uh, community-based organizations, not-for-profits. We partner with all of them to make sure that as we're bringing people into our workforce, we have partners and connections we can tap into to again look at a what I, I call it surround sound support that we can provide surround sound support to individuals who are, again, may, may be facing any number of barriers uh, to enter and be successful in the workplace. There is no way every single person on my team will tell you it is absolutely impossible for us to do that work on our own. We are not uh, financial counselors. We are not faith leaders as a corporation. We know our swim lane, but we have to think outside of our swim lane to make sure that we're engaging others that we need to join this collaboration to ensure that each of these people are successful. And um, we look at every, we, we, we talk big numbers to CVS Health, 300,000 employees, more than 1.2 million applicants a year for open jobs in our company. I think we fill over 100,000 open requisitions for positions in the company. Our team does not look at big numbers. We look at individuals. We want to understand what is it going to take you uh, Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Uh, to be successful in our organization. So anyway, I'm going to stop rambling, George. That's probably way more, you know, <laughs> than you even asked me in the question. But that's that's an that's an example of how we think about it. And we would not be successful if we didn't think about uh, collaborating with others uh, to fill in the gaps uh, that are outside of our swim lane. Well, that's right, David, and I love your passion. On collaboration, I, I thought you would be, you know, passionate about it. But to see your incredible enthusiasm, I, I, I share that honestly. I, I, I think that in order to develop that dynamic resiliency, which results from having partnerships, from having what you have, which is, I think, similar to what, what a lot of the leaders that we interview have, is the ability to seemingly peer around the corner, to be able to see emerging trends. And most importantly, to understand that it's about people, yeah. the people and the process, but ultimately about the people, your colleagues that you're changing the world with each and every day. And if you have that mindset, gosh, isn't that a game changer? Yeah, that's right. And speaking of game changers, we're at the point where I'd like to ask you a, a very simple, uh, but however profound question. And so David Casey, CVS Health, what are the three key pieces of advice that you would provide to our global audience to achieve the global goals? Yeah, I think there's three things, George. Um, and one is um, we, we talked about it already, so I won't belabor the point. But I think one is, is you have to collaborate and not just partner. You, you have to think about as we think about people the people we serve and the people we hire, you have to think about all the, the, the links in the supply chain for that, right? So from a workforce standpoint, it's about collaborating with, um, again, those organizations that can help fill in the gaps where, where that are outside your swim lane. As a company, we have to know how to talk to educators. And as a Fortune 5, I don't mean going to Washington, D.C. to talk to the Department of Education. I mean, in, in rural Alabama, we have to meet with a school principal to find out what his or her kids need to be successful to come to school every day so that we can help them in any way we can so that eventually we can hire them, right? So I think collaboration, more than just partnerships, but really understanding the entire um, supply chain or life cycle of people that you serve and people that you hire, collaboration is the first piece. I think the other piece is engage stakeholders. There are too many times I think we lock ourselves in a room and we problem solve for the people that we're trying to, to help, but we don't engage them in the conversation. So I think it's very critical to make sure that the people 
that we're coming together to have conversations about helping and lifting up. They need to be at the table as part of the conversation as well. And then I think the last part of it is kind of related to that second bucket. But as I've talked to people in communities, especially recently, as they're dealing with the ravages of COVID-19 or, or racial uh, brutality or inequity, what I'm hearing from people in the community is that we want to be empowered. We don't want to be saved. So as we have these conversations, I would encourage other organizations, other companies to think about how can you best position folks to be empowered? They're not looking for folks to swoop in and save the day and come in and go out. You know, it kind of goes back to that old adage about, you know, whether you teach a person to fish or you give them a fish, people want to be taught to fish and then they want to be empowered to, to, to go out and fish every day. So I would think, uh, George, those three things, collaborate, engage your stakeholders, and then also, um, you know, make sure that you're empowering uh, people and communities and not just swooping in to save them. If I could leave uh, anybody with three pieces of advice, that would be it. David Casey, Vice President, Workforce Strategies and Chief Diversity Officer at CBS Health and ultimately a leadership defined. David, thank you so much. Thank you for your inspiration. How can folks find out more about your work at CVS Health? You can always go to cvshealth.com. And if in particular, if you're looking to learn more about the workforce initiative space, uh, you can, you know, you can do cvshealth.com or CVS Health and, and uh, workforce initiatives. We have all kinds of information out on our website, um, you know, that you can learn about our workforce programs, what we're doing with COVID-19. Uh, we're engaged in a lot of things, but I would really encourage you to go out, take a look at the website, learn more about the company. Uh, we're always looking for partners to engage in this process. So you can always reach out to me. Uh, my email is david.casey at cvshealth.com. Uh, so please make sure we, we keep this dialogue going and collect, uh, connect and collaborate where we have the opportunity to. David, thank you for your inspiration. It's most importantly, thank you for your leadership. Thank you, George. See you.